Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 6 I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. We're here live from the ICC Banking Commission's annual meeting in Beijing with Lionel Taylor and John Bougea, the founders and managing directors of Trade Advisory Network. International trade continues to gain more headlines than ever before, with a fast-moving and increasingly complex global environment posing a range of challenges, from increasing concerns over protectionism and trade tensions to ongoing industry discussion over market disruption, disintermediation and the role of technology. In this podcast, I'm talking to Lionel and John about the impact of trade wars on the financing of international trade. Lionel is a trade, supply chain and invoice finance business leader with experience spanning several major financial institutions. Having co-authored qualifications for both ICC Academy as well as the London Institute of Banking and Finance, Lionel has extensive international experience with a specific understanding of Asia and China. John is an experienced trade supply chain and invoice specialist too, with more than 40 years experience in senior leadership roles. John has several areas of expertise, including origination, risk and governance, product management and development. John is chairing a panel at the ICC Banking Commission annual meeting here in Beijing on where trade tensions leave the market. And we are talking about some of the most pertinent problems that these are creating within the international trade finance community. So without further ado, here is Lionel and John joining us here from Beijing Hi both. Thank you very much for joining us on today's podcast. Good afternoon. So John, over to you. In no more than 30 seconds, what does Trade Advisory Network do? We work with banks, not banks, fintechs, technology providers, uh, investors, educational institutions and corporates. We work with them on a strategic basis. We add strategic consultancy for the development of propositions and also on the implementation. We write training and education materials. As you said earlier, we co-authored the ICC Academy Advanced Supply Chain Finance course and the London Institute of Banking and Finance Supply Chain Finance professional qualification. We work with investors who are looking to invest in fintechs or who have already invested in fintechs and would like somebody to do a health check and kick the tires. And finally, we work with corporates who are in need of a review of their financing of their working capital and are looking for new financial solutions. So we do an in-depth trade cycle analysis and then work with funders to place the facilities. Let's jump straight into the theme of this podcast. Lionel, what geopolitical and macroeconomic events today are affecting trade and trade finance? Well, obviously, we're sitting here in Beijing. So I think a good place to start is with China. And initially, most people will look at the trade tensions between the US and China and and the challenges of tariffs and all that discussion. And that's obviously one of the major events that's happening and affecting the world of trade, as is the slowdown in factory output in China as well. And there's a saying that when the largest economies catch a cold, others unfortunately catch pneumonia. And there is a fear currently that as China is suffering, not just the region, but you know the world as a whole will, will suffer as well. So obviously the trade tensions between US and China are not helping. I think when you move across the globe, being a Brit, we have to talk about Brexit. Obviously, Europe at the moment, there's so much uncertainty as to what's happening with the UK, and that's affecting the whole of the European Union. So there are a number of situations happening in the world which affect trade. And the the two, I think, main ones we talk about, as we said, is the US-China tariff scenario, Brexit, but also you have a war somewhere or you have a bit of disturbance. So there's been some disturbances in the Middle East, which unfortunately, again, affect the world of trade. And continuing on from this, John, how serious a threat does protectionism pose to the future of trade? And what are the key issues that this is having on global trade? 
I think that protectionism has a negative effect on everyone. So when a country imposes or threatens to impose import tariffs to try and protect their own industry, the effect is often to damage that country even more harshly than the countries that they're trying to protect against. So the, the, the situation in the States, for example, has apparently, according to The Economist, done more damage to, to the US economy than it's done to the Chinese economy. So nobody really wins when you have uh, rampant protectionism. I think the other effect of protectionism is that the companies that are involved in trade generally can fall into two categories. You have the large global corporates with lots of negotiating power and lots of options. And then you have the smaller companies who don't have those negotiating skills or opportunities. So the large corporates can start adjusting their supply chains. Not immediately, they can't react immediately by switching supply, but they can move the supply around. So they can regionalize supply chains, they can bring a manufacturing onshore, they, or nearshoring as it's sometimes known. And over a period of time, for example, they can move uh, sourcing from China, where the, the US has a, a problem, to Vietnam, where the US doesn't currently have a problem. And there are lots of reasons that trend was happening before protectionism started, but has accelerated since the imposition or the threat of imposition of increased tariffs on Chinese goods. So a large corporate can manage that relatively easily over a period of time. They can also pass on some of the costs associated with protectionism and increased tariffs because they've got that level of bargaining power. A smaller corporate, like an SME, has very little choice. They're usually sitting in the middle of a supply chain and their suppliers are whoever they are. They don't change because of uh, tariffs. And their buyers equally remain their buyers. So they have to grin and bear it. That problem is exacerbated by the fact that the financing opportunities that a smaller company has are more restricted than would be the case with a global corporate. So as soon as you start shifting physical supply chains, one of the consequences it may well be that you have a more extended trade cycle. So you're carrying more stock, you're ordering from further afield if you're trying to avoid a particular market. That All of that translates into a higher working capital requirement. Now, the largest global corporates have got lots of ways of funding working capital. One of them is trade finance and supply chain finance, but they can raise finance any number of ways. They also have very good negotiating positions relative to the other parties in the supply chain whether that be their suppliers or their buyers. So they can push the problem of financing the increased working capital requirement, either upstream or downstream, usually to smaller companies. And the smaller companies then struggle to raise the finance, and they struggle particularly to raise the finance at reasonable rates. So these are the consequences. Over the long haul, things will tend to stabilise, and new supply chains will evolve, which will tend to level themselves out. A point of equilibrium, I guess, will be reached. Technology will also play a part, as you see. The the rise in automation, robotics, and so on, means that there is a lower dependence on manual labor for manufacturing, which means low labor cost economies, or traditionally low labor cost economies, cease to have that competitive advantage. So you can actually move manufacturing anywhere. And that often means moving them closer to where you're selling the goods, not necessarily your home market. Most exporters are also importers. This is a two-way flow. It's not just a binary decision. I'm an importer, therefore I'm going to import from China, or I'm an exporter, I must export to the United States. Most things go in multiple directions. So technology means you can move your manufacturing closer to your customers, which is a trend that's, that is already visible. That will be accelerated, I think, because of protectionism. Another more exciting or potentially more uh, futuristic trend is 3D printing. Not new by any means, but 3D printing has the effect of turning physical goods, manufacture and shipment into effectively a service. So you sell a piece of kit, basically a printer, which can be pretty big, which is a physical export. And then you sell licenses to allow the user of that kit to manufacture the components locally. And then you charge for the license. That avoids the physical movement of goods and saves costs, and it avoids the tariffs. That's still a very small percentage of global trade, but that technology is getting better. And the one school of thought is that that will take up a lot of the slack. The jury's out as to whether that will actually happen or not. There are a large number of people who don't believe that will happen, but I think we're all already seeing some signs of that happening. Very, very interesting. And I think I was reading an article recently about 3D printing for construction materials mm. for buildings. Mm. 
And suddenly that has a, a very big impact on trade flows. But I guess you're right, as a result of protectionism and various movements there, suppliers, traders, producers look at mm. changing their, their trade flows, essentially, mm-hmm. to use things like nearshoring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lionel, in the face of trade tensions, what are the main challenges this faces for banks, financiers, corporates, and also SMEs? I mean, funders are not immune to the problems that are happening in the world of trade. We mentioned before one of the big effects of Brexit. And if you're looking at Brexit, you're looking at banks and banks and trying to decide, what do, what do we do? Do we stay in the UK? Do we move operations onto, into Europe? So banks themselves are also having discussions as to what they do. As the trade flows and the way trading is undertaken changes, the banks need to adapt. Now, one of the effects um, John mentioned before was you, you often have these lengthening trade flows. Whether companies in China are moving towards Vietnam, which they are doing, and, and you've got this, the Koreans and the Japanese all moving into, for example, Vietnam at the moment, that then has an effect that the suppliers locally, who are found locally, suddenly need facilities to support their selling into these big corporates, and the banks are not necessarily equipped to support them. So there are challenges, and sometimes these major corporates look to their global banks with um, payables finance type programs and say, you know, we're now sourcing more from Vietnam or from Thailand or from wherever, we need you to extend the programs into those countries. And those banks are not necessarily well equipped to actually provide, do the onboarding and the KYC and all that's associated with it to extend those programs. But so you do have a challenge as a bank when your major corporate shifts. How do you cope with that shift? No major bank likes to admit that they cannot cope and they're not equipped to, to meet that challenge. So there is a challenge when you're looking at your major corporate clients to keep your share of the wallet. As John mentioned before, when you're an SME looking for funding, if you're an SME on the ground, suddenly in the country that's become in vogue, yet your banking system and your and is not equipped to fund working capital, you have a challenge. If you're a small company who are importing as well as exporting and your, tr- your trade cycle lengthens, then you're having to either carry more cost and more working capital through your operations so you often knock on the door of your banks asking for help and i think as well reported by the likes of ifc and others there's a 1.5 trillion dollar gap in financing for small businesses so we are seeing challenges generally in the market not necessarily just caused by the fact of the protectionism and some of the stuff that's going on around tariffs and what have you but the banks themselves have had problems since the financial crash around increased regulation, capital requirements, and need to sort of decide internally who are we and what do we want to be. And often that's been at the cost of the smaller businesses and the smaller business end as to how to fund them, which is what's creating the opportunity, allegedly, for the non-bank funders to come in to try and cover the areas that the main banks are not currently covering or do not wish to cater for. Thanks, Lionel. We'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about financing of trade and and how that's changed. John, following on from this, what sectors are impacted the most from trade wars and trade tensions? Is it high margin? Is it low margin products? I think it's any trade any supply chain which is complex is going to be most affected by the, uh, the the trade tariffs and the protectionism. So if you take the automotive sector, for example, then you have multi-tiered suppliers. So the manufacturers may be sitting in Europe or North America, or indeed Japan and Taiwan and Korea and so on. But the supply chain is pretty global. So the engineering may take place in the UK. The manufacturing may take of, of components may take place in South Korea even though the final manufacture of the cars is taking place in Germany. So you've got value-add components taking place on a cross-border basis multiple times before you know, the final finished product rolls off the production line and is then distributed through to retailers. So lots of opportunities for trade tariffs to get in the way 
those sorts of industries also are because they're physical goods quite high worth capital goods they also are expensive so stockholding or inventory finance is a big issue the more complex the supply chain the greater the build up of inventory and nobody ever wants to hold the inventory on their balance sheet so it's usually one of the weaker parties in the supply chain that ends up holding the the inventory because the, the stronger parties negotiate their way out of it so the weaker parties hold the inventory the trade tariffs make that lengthier more expensive and so on i think you'll see the same sort of thing with technology so you know apple iPhones for example the number of suppliers that provide component is phenomenally high and it and it covers a lot of countries just to have one phone there's a lot of components from large parts of the world the imposition of tariffs causes cost and friction and they can't quickly and easily switch suppliers because they have to be approved they have to they have to produce to a spec that is agreed otherwise you have uh, reliability and quality problems so in the short term that translates into challenges for each step each manufacturer or pr- producer or processor in the process and probably a more expensive end product for the customer retailing is where the rubber hits the road if you like in terms of consumer goods and retailing is a notoriously difficult volatile sector in most markets and in the UK it's well known as a is a horrific sector to be comfortable in because it's so cutthroat it's difficult so the impact of tariffs might not be immediately evident but it works its way through the system and it ends up with the consumer i think the same will be said of pharmaceuticals pharmaceuticals have to be licensed they have to pass certain tests if tariffs are introduced or non-tariff barriers are introduced which are even more insidious in a sense because they're less visible it just makes it harder for the goods to cross borders even though there isn't a tariff increase that can cause a disruption to supply in a big way and it might just be one element in a final product which is a treatment for a, an illness perhaps and if that one product is missing from the supply chain the whole production stops or slows down that has quite far reaching effects at a at an individual level not just in an industry level so i think the more complex the supply chain the greater the impact arguably if the supply chain is relatively simple you know two parties rather than multiple parties and the margins are high which is unlikely by and large if the margins are high it's because the supply chain is complex and there's lots of value add then i guess the impact will be less but most complex supply chains that's where you'll find the higher margins and that's where the big impact's going to be thanks john and i know you'll be speaking to rebecca harding at coriolis technologies who who we spoke to last week on very specifically some of these complex supply chains and how you can look to costing out the price of importing and exporting and actually optimize the supply chain and increase the flow at a, at a more profitable level. Mm-hmm. So this week, TFG launched our white paper on the global state of supply chain finance. We looked at the SCF market, focusing on UK-China corridors. Clearly a potential opportunity here in light of the UK exiting the EU and in light of US-China tensions. However, in both markets, CFOs consistently reported challenges in accessing finance, releasing liquidity and working capital from their supply chains, and the need to explore other forms of trade and SCF such as off-balance sheet finance and securitization. Coupled with the current outlook is the regulatory treatment of trade finance, namely Basel III regulation, where bank-intermediated trade faces challenges. John, how has the financing of trade changed since the global financial crisis? One of the dubious benefits of having been around a while is that you see patterns emerge, which you've seen before. And trade finance has been almost a cyclical business So going back to my earliest days in the business, trade finance was exciting. It was the thing to do in banking. Everyone wanted to do it. The banks all invested in it, had huge correspondent networks, global presence, and it was the thing to do. It became less fashionable as derivatives, capital markets, equities, and corporate finance became the the, the place where you made big money. And films like Wall Street, greed is good type uh, comments were made. Trade finance was distinctly unfashionable at that point. In fact, transaction banking generally was it was regarded as an operations business. This is not something you brag about. You're good at trade. You're good at uh, invoice finance. This is something you just did and tried to uh, keep under the radar. 
before the financial crisis, everyone was really, all the banks were really committed to investment banking because that's how you make lots of money. Sadly, it turns out that's also how you can lose lots of money extremely quickly. And transaction banking, once again, became popular. It became stable. And it became the opposite of so-called casino banking. So the transaction banking is driven by customers. It's not driven by placing a bet on a future movement of a price. Every trade finance transaction relates to an underlying movement of goods or delivery of services. So it's entirely customer driven. And in that sense, it is the ultimate honorable business that any bank or non-bank finance provider can be in, in my view. So at the t- about the time of the crash, the banks were quite keen to say, actually, we're really good at transaction banking because look, look how we support industry. We make payments. We lend money to finance international trade. This is a good thing. So we're actually really good guys. So the immediate aftermath was a promotion of trade. Unfortunately, it coincided with a a collapse in trade uh, because of the financial crisis. So it became quite difficult for banks to invest in a business which was shrinking. The way trade finance was provided, and I'm not talking about the big ticket structured trade deals here, I'm talking about the mass market supply chain type deals, it became difficult to make a lot of money doing that business because the volume of business available went down in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. So banks reacted by trying to create transaction banking businesses as self-contained businesses. If you bolt enough of these businesses together, it creates a balance sheet and a profit and loss account, which looks reasonable. But it didn't really compensate for the fact that the global markets for international trade had had declined and have only really relatively recently started to pick up in any in a serious way. So that's a positive step after the financial crisis. Unfortunately, the negative was the imposition of compliance regulations at a much tougher level. It's not that they're not needed. It's just that they impacted trade perhaps disproportionately relative to its real risk. So doing trade finance business became more difficult from a capital adequacy perspective and also from a KYC and anti-money laundering and uh, sanctions compliance perspective. So the cost of doing this business just got higher. And I think the consequences of that, or those changes, uh, have been that in the global corporate space, the major investment grade client segments, the banks can still deliver those services, but it's quite difficult to make an acceptable return because of the capital treatment. So they tended to move towards originating and then selling, not keep so many assets on their balance sheet. All the banks have have um, single name concentration limits as well, or prudential limits, and and they're because they're more heavily regulated than they used to be. These are biting more aggressively than they used to. So that puts a constraint on how much business the banks can do, even with the largest corporates for whom they have a lot of credit appetite. So they're constrained there. As you move into the mid markets in the SME sector, the cost of origination and the risk which generates the capital a requirement become really difficult for the banks. So unless this is plain vanilla business, then it's really difficult to do trade finance or provide trade and supply chain finance to small companies. The KYC requirements, the conduct risk requirements, the need to demonstrate that you haven't missold a solution to an SME means you have a lot of cost in origination. So the net result of that has been that SMEs are not really getting the solutions that they need to grow. Whilst the larger corporates are getting what they need, but they're constrained in terms of uh, overall appetite because of the reasons I've just mentioned. So what's happened to offset that? There has been an emergence of non-bank solutions. But perhaps we'll, we'll come on to that later. Thanks, John. And I know we've published quite a lot about the trade finance distribution originate to distribute initiative. Lionel, non-bank financing offerings are increasingly coming to the scene as many institutional funds, technology providers and other new players consider the potential for the trade finance market. But there's still a long way to go. And you you mentioned earlier the 1.5 trillion US dollar trade finance gap. Why isn't there much institutional money and non-bank finance facilitating trade right now? I think, again, again, what we've noticed, and we speak to many funds and institutions that have pockets of liquidity looking for yield, to be honest, they're more attracted to the banks where they're they're buying the assets off the bank's balance sheets because it's a bigger volume. And, you know, so naturally they're drawn to support the banks. That's certainly what we've noticed. 
The challenge, of course, with that type of distribution is if I'm buying directly from a bank, at least I know what I'm getting. If that parcel of asset, trade asset, is being sold by a bank to one party who sells it onto another party, etc., I personally have fears as to what that might lead to. And, I, and let's think about the financial crash that happened in the subprime. Are we going down the same route, depending on how far removed you are from actually the principal who was originating the asset? And that, I'll be honest, does worry me. But in terms of the non-banks, so the non-banks generally entered the market initially after the crash by slating the banks. The entrance was in, the banks have behaved badly, the banks are not interested in you, they, you know, they grab everything as security. And a lot of players came in with the promise, you know, you use us when you need us. And we're nicer, we're friendlier, we're now having technology to make it easy to onboard, you know, it's automated credit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there were a lot of promises made. But it's very, very hard to scale those businesses because at the end of the day, most companies, no matter how much they would slate the banks, rely on the banks. Either that the banks already have all the assets of security, so they have a, a charge or a pledge over every asset. So it's a lot harder for the non-bank to carve out their bit. The other challenge that's happened is a lot of the non-banks initially were funded by some of these institutions and they were promised the high yields but the volumes are so small that in the whole scheme of things a lot of these funds are saying well actually is it worth it so there is a challenge for these non-banks in terms of scalability in terms of how they scale so what are we seeing we're seeing a lot of the new technology coming in to try and partner with the existing banks because it's the banks that have the client base and there's some initiatives in some countries, we know in the UK, the initiative, if the bank can't provide the funding, then it should be passing the deal on to an approved non-bank. And there's varying stories as to how successful or not that is. And actually, you speak to some of the non-banks and they say it's all marketing. At the end of the day, they have a bank trying to pass on all the problem clients to the non-bank. So it's a bit of a mixed bag currently. I mean, the truth is, for the market to really move to support that 1.5 trillion gap, you need the banks to play. When it, when it comes down to it, there can be a lot of initiatives and, and the banks are supporting some of those initiatives, but it's the banks invariably that move the market. So the challenge in the developed markets, as John mentioned before, the retention of capital, the focus on the best return for the least effort and cost, a lot of the consortiums we're seeing in trade and what have you, which are promising wonderful things, but it's really starting with an efficiency play for the banks to make what they're doing today more efficient. That doesn't necessarily increase the level of funding to the customers. And as mentioned, was mentioned previously, where you have a need for pre-shipment funding, no one is actually saying at the moment, we have, now more, we have more data available to us, so therefore we will now extend our funding earlier into the supply chain. I think it will come, and I believe it will come in some years, but it's not happening necessarily on a big scale today. When you move out of the developed world into the developing world, so we're here in Asia at the moment, then you have a challenge of skill base. So a lot of the banks in Southeast Asia can provide funding alone. They're happy providing a loan against an asset like a property but they're still not equipped and skilled enough as yet to provide finance for working capital against what a lot will call a movable asset, which is normally a receivable. And there's a lot of effort with ICC Academy, London Institute of Banking and Finance, a lot of sort of pushing of skills and training to help equip these banks to start providing those, those type of facilities to smaller companies. But of course, you need a change of regulation. It's no good having a technology without the training. It's no good having technology training if you haven't got legal regulations in place in the country that support the financing of receivables so that someone can actually state, I'm financing that receivable. It's registered. I have first call and what have you. So, I mean, there's a lot that needs to change. I don't honestly believe it's the non-banks that move the market, but it's the non-banks that often sort of throw the darts into the dartboard that start to 
provoke some discussion and some movement. Very, very interesting. And I guess the idea that the non-banks and maybe even technology providers can almost catalyze that, but ultimately it will be banks that will be deploying that capital in the end. That's that's very interesting. I guess the idea of thinking of banks as partners as opposed to competitors in our world is is very important. And, and finally, we talk about it quite a lot, the trade finance education gap. It's a, it's a big issue, particularly in developing markets, but even in more, even in well-established but, markets. I was going to say, we also, I mean, talk about, which we didn't mention, you know, talk about Alibaba, Amazon, some of these big data capturers who are turning their hand towards providing finance. And there's no doubt they will have an effect because they will often cover the tail of suppliers in, in a supply chain that are not being reached by major programs. The interesting question is what happens when there's a real downturn? Because so often we've seen in the past, non-banks, and often it was the logistic companies in the past, came into a market which prov- started to provide finance, which wasn't really core to their main activities. And as soon as the market conditions had changed, they pulled away. And who was left? It was the banks. So I know there's a lot of talk at the moment about a lot of these non-banks getting involved, but there is a question in an economic downturn, will they still be willing to play? Or will it again be the banks that are left? Very interesting, very, very thought-provoking. So I guess just to conclude today's podcast, and I'm going to ask both of you the same question, what is your short to medium term outlook on trade trade tensions and where do these trade tensions leave the international trade finance market? So if I begin on that, trade is not going to stop. Um, We've already mentioned that as China and the US have the tariffs war or situation at the moment, then you have some of those exporters and manufacturers moving their production to other countries. And that doesn't happen overnight. So one might say that the Vietnams and the and other countries in Southeast Asia are benefiting from the, the trade war between China and the US. And I guess if you move operations into another country, you're not going to pull them out very quickly. And this is a reason for doing so. So trade finds a way around all these obstacles. And I think that's what will happen. I think we see things in a very short term effect. But I think in the longer term, trade will continue. There'll be bumps in the road. But I still believe that the opportunity in terms of supporting and financing trade, both from a financing and risk mitigation perspective, will still exist. They'll still be demanded and there will still be some good returns. If anything, the technology that's coming along, and we've spoken a little bit on the, on the sidelines about technology, is all going to aid those developments, not hinder. So I see a very good picture for the future. Okay, let's just focus on Brexit and the European Union for a second. Just illustratively, and it's current, like this week, things will happen again. A lot of scaremongering is evident about, you know, if we don't have a trade deal, trade is going to stop. We know that's not true. You know, lots of trade happens without a trade deal. So trade, as Lionel says, trade has a habit of working itself out. So the trading companies, not the politicians, decide where they're going to buy and where they're going to sell. And if, if conditions become a little bit more difficult, they'll find a way around it over a longer period. They, it might be disruptive in the short term, but not over the long haul. So it's not all about the politicians putting in place trade deals. What does it impact trade is the uncertainty. Because it's difficult to plan and change your sourcing and your selling model if you think you need to, if you don't know what the scenario looks like, you don't know what the circumstances are going to be, you suspend, you defer. And that's not good. So it's the uncertainty that it causes more trouble for trading companies than the actual imposition of tariffs. Once the tariffs are there, they can make decisions. I mean, they may be damaging. Everyone might get a little bit poorer as a result of the trade war, if the trade war becomes the, the new global model. But over time, things happen in cycles. There will be some protectionism. Perhaps it'll be acute. Perhaps we'll all get a little poorer. And then there'll be a realization that a more open approach to trading globally does it helps everyone. And hopefully these barriers will reduce. But the uncertainty is what causes a problem. So 
I'm not that worried in the sense that once a decision is made to impose tariffs or agree a free trade agreement or leave the EU, people will get on with making it work. The bigger challenge is education, which is a need irrespective of whether there are free trade agreements in place or whether there are trade tariffs. There is a lack of education. And education leads to policy within the lending institutions. And the policy change coupled with the education leads to increased appetite to support companies that trade internationally. So it's not technology. Technology already exists and technology is getting more advanced all the time. So the the development of technological solutions to support supply chain finance, that's not the obstacle. That could happen tomorrow. But if the credit functions and the legal functions, the compliance functions do not react and apply policies and practices which are consistent with the use of that technology, then the appetite is not going to change. So as Lionel mentioned earlier, we take that 1.5 or $1.6 trillion gap, depending on which report you read. Could technology help address that? It, it could by providing visibility and control of underlying goods and the data, which should provide a greater degree of comfort that you're going to get repaid if you're a lender. But if the, po- if the credit policies and the practices don't change, then that's not going to help. And the credit policies and practices won't change unless it's an education. They need to understand how things work. And there's an old, two old sayings that go back into banking in what was then known as merchant banking, which is now international trade finance banking, years ago, which is if you lend cash, you want cash back. It's fairly self-evident. And the other associated saying is tangible security, like property, does not make a good source of repayment for a trade transaction. So why is it that even in the developed economies, most lending to SMEs is underpinned by, guess what, fixed asset security, tangible security over property? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't allow businesses to grow. That's even more the case in emerging markets. So that education about understanding the trade cycle, understanding how you can track and control exposure. And one of the applications of technology, which has been underplayed, I think, is how can you use technology to track and control your exposure? to track the goods, to maintain security interest in the goods in order to ensure that you do get paid and you do get your cash back. Those are all applications of technology which have not yet fully developed, but the technology exists. So it needs to be accompanied by education and policy. And that's a bigger risk or opportunity than debates about uh, protectionism. Great. Well, look, thank you very much, John Lionel. Really looking forward to hearing from you here at the ICC Banking Commission annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.